Well, we have questions from Canada, right? And so, from Canada, in person, in person. you know, uh, Dr. Yves Longtin from Quebec, University of Quebec, and he will talk to us on patient participation. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome him, please. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. So, um, yeah, so my name is Yves Longtin. Uh, I'm an ID specialist. I, I, I trained here in Geneva for, uh, for three years, so uh, I'm very happy to be back to my second home. Um, I'm here to talk to you about patient participation. Uh, what is patient participation, also called patient involvement, patient empowerment? It's the basic idea of inviting patients to remind healthcare workers to perform hand hygiene be before caring for them. Now, Dr. Voss uh, introduced a concept a few minutes ago and uh, stating that it should not be the fail-safe system. Uh, we should not expect patients to, to, to be responsible for healthcare workers' hand hygiene and that this, this was uh, not a good, a good way to, to proceed. Well, over the last, the next few minutes, I'll try to convince you that actually this is the future. Um, you can tell me if, uh, if I'm right or, or wrong. So, well, the main objectives of this presentation is to, to review the evidence supporting the concept of patient involvement to improve staff hand hygiene compliance. We're, we will review the main obstacles uh, from the patient's perspective, and I'll try to provide you some insight on three important issues. Do patients ask, and, and what if they don't ask? And what is healthcare workers' opinion regarding, uh, regarding the, this, uh, this whole concept? So, um, j just to also, we have to keep things in into perspective. Um, what we expect from patients is to remind healthcare workers to perform hand hygiene before touching them. So, um, a lot of people say that it will not work because it had no impact on their overall hand hygiene compliance in their hospital. But just keep in mind that improving one, hand hygiene, one of the five indications for hand hygiene may not have a, an impact on your overall hand hygiene compliance in your hospital. So already saying that it has no impact is, 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 is flawed. I mean, it, probably it will, don't ha it will not have a, an impact on your overall hand hygiene compliance in your hospital. But why do we want health patients to, to ask about hand hygiene for this specific indication? Uh, well, because it is the least respected indication for hand hygiene. Uh, many studies, this is a slide that was provided to me by, by Hugo Sachs that shows that healthcare workers uh, do not perform hand hygiene about half the time before touching a patient. And obviously there is a benefit, a clear benefit. Which indication has the most benefit for the patient? It is this one. So I don't think we'll ever go to involving patients into reminding healthcare workers into performing hand hygiene, for example, after patient contact or after body fluid exposure, because it doesn't really have a direct benefit to them. But this one, obviously, there's room for improvement and patients could help us. Now, patients have been invited to participate in, their, in, in the care process, in the healing process, in many different ways over the last decades, centuries, millennium. Actually, forever, we have invited patients to participate in obtaining a clear diagnosis. We expect from them to give us their symptoms. Uh, we expect them to participate in the physical examination. So this one's a given. We've always expected patients to participate in the diagnosis. About three decades ago, we, we, we suddenly realized that patients should have also their word into the decision-making process of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the healing process. So um, we started inviting patients to give their opinion about treatment, for example. Should they undergo chemotherapy or surgery in case of cancer? And I can tell you that 30 years ago, some, pa some doctors were really against this concept. They thought that patients didn't have either the medical knowledge or the emotional stability to take such important, rational decision. So there was a lot, there was a lot of reluctance at, the, at that time, but now it's a given. Now it's widely accepted. We've, been a bit, uh, we've gone a bit further afterwards. Now we've tried, we started to, to involve patients in the treatment and monitoring of disease, and this has shown to have a huge impact, for example. You can even train children with chronic asthma to recognize their symptoms and adjust their therapy, and this has been shown to, to diminish 
school absenteeism to diminish hospitalization. So you can train patients to take care, to look after their own disease. We do this for, for diabetes, for example, they adjust their insulin. So what is the last part of the, of the healing process, of the care process? It's to prevent errors. That's what, that's what actually, that's what we're going after with hand hygiene, participation in hand hygiene. Can patient participate in preventing errors? When, when, you, look at, when you look at all, the, all the, the, what we've been through in the last, over the last few decades, there, there's no doubt that we should at least try this, this new avenue. So, Patients have already been involved in different uh, ways to prevent medical errors. Just to review some of the papers, um, patients have already been involved into preventing uh, catheter-related infections. In the study from Muller in 2005, they have trained patients to take care of their own tunneled catheters, to change their dressing, to, uh, to flush the catheter. And this has led to a 50% reduction in CLAPSI rate compared to the control, which was regular nursing care. Why? Probably because the patients are, it's their own catheter, so they really don't want it to be infected. We've also involved patients into preventing wrong side surgery by signing the, the, the leg, for example, that needs to be operated on. There has been studies into, uh, involving patients into preventing medication errors. And in this particular study, they involve patients into knowing their medication list, their schedule, and the adverse events. And in this study, 30% of the nurses in the ward said that at least once during the, the study trial, the patient or family member prevented a medication error. So it's, it's not 0%, it's not 100%, but patients can catch medication errors. And the last one here I have is patient participation to detect and report surgical site infections. In this study, surgical site infection, as you, you're probably all aware, is, it's hard to detect because many of them uh, occur at home. So they train patients to recognize the symptoms of surgical site and communicate with doctors if they, if they develop them. And this has been shown to be very sensitive, but not very specific, though. They, they tend to overcall because any redness to them is infection, but it has been done in the past. So you see, what we're talking about, involving patients into in, improving hand hygiene, it's, at first it can, can be very striking, but when you think about it, we, we, that's where we are now. This is the new, this is the new it, it's a new way to go. So what do we know about patient participation in hand hygiene? Well, about 15 countries around the world now are actively promoting the involvement of patients to improve hand hygiene. In the USA, the, 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 there's a Speak Up uh, campaign that has been set up by the, by the Joan Commission where they suggest four things you can do to prevent infection. And you see that the second, the second thing that patients can do is make sure that healthcare providers clear the, clean their hands and wear gloves. In the United Kingdom, um, in, in his uh, 2006 annual report, the chief medical officer uh, clearly stated that, uh, that the Clean Your Hands campaign should further, further strengthen the support of patient involvement. In Canada, there's also the Agrema Canada and there's the Safer Healthcare uh, Now campaign that invites health patients to, to remind healthcare workers to perform hand hygiene. So just three examples. And they give, here it's in French, but they, they give you, uh, they even give examples of, of how patients can bring up the topic to their healthcare workers. Now, there are some, obviously there are some obstacles from the patient's perspective to, to, to such kind of, of, of uh, involvement. First, it has always been known that, that the lack of knowledge and the low health literacy is, has always been an impediment to patient participation, not only in hand hygiene, but all the other ones. And patients are less likely to be involved in decisions requiring medical knowledge and clinical expertise. Now, how does this apply to hand hygiene? Well, when we asked 200 patients in, in Geneva, should healthcare worker cleanse their hands uh, before shaking a patient's hand? Well, quite surprisingly, 30% didn't think it was required. So for these 30% of patients, it's not even an issue. Why would I remind a healthcare worker to perform hand hygiene before touching me? He doesn't really need to do it, sorry. So you see here, there, there will be a need to, to give more knowledge to patients, to train them in the indica into the, the, the right indications for hand hygiene. Now there's also the question of stakes. Um, 
Patients are really interested into participating in major issues, major decisions, for example, surgery, but not into minor one, you know, prescription diet, for example, or, uh, or prescription for bed rest. It's not, a, not something that they really want to have their voice uh, into these, these stakes. So is hand hygiene uh, a huge issue for patients? Well, there's, um, in, in the same survey we conducted in Geneva, we asked them, how often do you think nurses wash their hands before caring for you? And well, more than half of patients said that it was done all the time. So for them, why would I remind healthcare workers about hand hygiene if they already do it already all the time? So here, stakes might be an issue as well. So do patients ask and does it work? Well, the proportion of patients who reported having asked a, patient, a healthcare worker, either a nurse or a doctor, uh, varies a lot between studies. Uh, these are the main studies that have been conducted on, on patient involvement into hand hygiene. Uh, three of them were conducted by Marianne McGuckin, who's a, a, a researcher in the United States, but who also worked in, in, in the United Kingdom. And in these studies, the, the proportion of patients who report asking a nurse was about 90%, very high, and about 30% reported asking a physician. In these studies, about the, these have been associated with an, a significant increase in soap consumption. We don't have a single study that has evaluated the impact of patient involvement into improving uh, hand hygiene compliance, real compliance. It's always a surrogate marker, soap consumption. Now, in the two more recent studies conducting in the United States, the proportion of patients reporting asking was much lower, 0, 5, 10, 15 percent. How can this uh, happen? Well, probably there, there are many reasons. First, in the Megakin studies, patients were individually recruited to participate, which means that they were highly trained and highly motivated. Those who didn't want to participate were just excluded from the studies. So there's a, selection, there's a selection, I would call it bias, into these studies. Um, also, one other thing is that we don't know how much healthcare workers supported the campaigns in the more recent studies. If you implement a campaign but healthcare workers really don't like it, probably patients will not dare asking. There has been a, a, um, another study that has been presented only as an abstract in the, at the fifth decennial. Um, where they evaluated the proportion of patients who ask uh, nurses and doctors about hand hygiene after viewing the Hand Hygiene Saves Lives video, which is a video that has been made by the CDC and which is freely available and which in some hospitals is, can be viewed on the, on the personal TVs uh, for patients. And in this study that was pretty large, it's, it's multicentric, uh, many hospitals, uh, it has been associated with a significant increase in patients asking nurses, it doubled from four to eight percent, but this is self-reported uh, asking. But it was also associated with a significant increase in doctors reporting being asked by a patient. Okay, so it's a significant increase, but from two to five percent. So not, not a huge proportion of patients do ask, but at least this information is very valuable because it, it, it controls for the, for the desirability bias Probably a lot of patients will report that they, they did ask, but actually they did not. It's just, it's, just a, it's just a desirability bias. Now, in Geneva, 80% um, of patients reported that they, they, they know about healthcare associated infections, and many of them considered them uh, a serious problem. Um, about 40% of patients identified hand hygiene as the most important prevention, preventive measure. And 66% believe that healthcare workers should perform hand hygiene before shaking hands with a patient. Nevertheless, most would not feel, about 60% would not feel comfortable to ask healthcare worker whether they cleans their hands. One of the reasons why they don't dare, well, so there's a few reasons here, is that, well, first, they believe that caregivers should know already, so about 25%, that was their main reason but also because they believe it is not part of the patient's role, which means that if you want this, 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 this concept to be widely accepted, you need to redefine the patient role that in that it is okay to intervene in such a way because now, especially for older patients, it's just not a way to, to behave. How can I tell a doctor, for example, how to treat me? 
There's the feeling of embarrassment, awkwardness also, which is there. Fear of reprisals, surprisingly, yeah, the fear that maybe they'll be less well cared for afterwards. And the perception of being impolite or disrespectful. However, if we explicitly invite them to ask, you, you remove already a huge barrier. And in this, when we ask them, how likely are you to ask about hand hygiene uh, if the healthcare worker wears such a badge, you know, a badge that says, ask me if they're clean, the proportion of patients who are ready to ask more than doubled from 34% to 82% for a nurse. So it means that if you want patients to ask, you, you, you have to enlist the collaboration of healthcare workers. In, uh, in the UK study also, they, they evaluated that handing over an alcohol-based hand rub solution bottle to patients would also increase the proportion of patients who are, who are likely to ask from 49 to 70%. So you've got to authorize in some way, either giving a bottle, wearing a badge. If you do this, you will increase the proportion of patients who ask. But it is clear that if you want patients to give you some feedback, healthcare workers need to be ready to delegate some power and share responsibilities. So here, we're not talking about patients becoming the fail-safe system. We don't expect the patient to, 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 to detect every error. We're just expecting patients and healthcare workers both to work together to prevent errors. So a lot of people often say, you know, passengers are not expected to make sure that there's enough fuel in the tanks before takeoff for an airplane, right? And I completely agree with that. But I can, I, I'm pretty sure that if you detect some smoke coming out of an engine as a, as a passenger and you notify the, the stewardess, I don't think anyone will tell you you shouldn't, you shouldn't have. You know, everybody will be pretty happy that you detected this error and that you voiced your opinion. So you should see it more like this. Of course, there are many other ways to detect an engine failure. But if a passenger detects something, he could speak up his mind, and nobody will tell him that he was wrong doing it. Now, do, patient, do healthcare workers welcome patients' input? This is, this, is, this is a good question, because many, many of those, of those programs have involved uh, in, have invited patients to participate, but have never asked really what healthcare workers think about these things. And they are very concerned about it. So we conducted a survey in Geneva, uh, a mailed in survey. We, we tried to reach 700 uh, healthcare workers. And we got, I think, a pretty decent re uh, response rate of 41%, uh, which is, I have to admit, very low, but it is a rule. I mean, it's, it's, it's the norm when you do a mailed in survey for healthcare workers. So we got about 300 uh, respondents. And what did they think? Well, first, they thought that they could improve their hand hygiene compliance. 67% believed that their hand hygiene compliance could be improved. And we were, but there, there could be a selection bias here, but 66% also believed that, that, that they would like to be reminded by patients if patients detect that they forgot to perform hand hygiene before caring for them. So 66% of those who answered the survey, I have to agree with you, I have to acknowledge, there's a selection bias in the respondents, of course. But this is it's getting more interesting later. Now, how many of those, of those respondents were ready to wear a badge inviting, explicitly inviting patients to ask about hand hygiene? Well, I was pretty surprised that it's not everyone. Only about half of healthcare workers were ready to wear such a badge, which means that why would, you re why would you refuse? It seems to be like, yeah, in principle, I cannot be against this, but I'm not going to do anything to help patients ask me about it. So this is how you could perceive it. Now, we dug a little deeper into the feelings of healthcare workers and asked questions that are more, a bit more taboo. Um, First, there's about a quarter of respondents who thought that inviting patients to participate would just be a waste of time, too time consuming. About 10% thought that it could negatively affect their reputation if they had to acknowledge that they, they forgot to perform hand hygiene. And this is the typical answer when a patient asks, did you, did, you, did you wash your hands? Most of the time, if you didn't do it in front of the patient, you'll just say, I did it in the corridor. I just did it in the corridor, right? It's the easy answer. It's easier to say that than to say, I'm sorry, I forgot, but thanks for reminding me. About 17% said that they would be upset about these questions. 
27% felt that it would be humiliating for them to be reminded by a patient to cleanse their hands. 26% said that being reminded by it to perform hand hygiene by a patient in front of other caregivers, a nurse, for example, a doctor being reminded that there's a nurse nearby, would make, would make them look inept. 35% felt that it would feel that their, their, their work is, in, is questioned if patients ask about hand hygiene. 43% would be ashamed to admit that they forgot to cleanse their hands. And 48%, half of the people felt that patients could become angry if they detect that they forgot to perform hand hygiene. And finally, 44% would be guilty if a patient discovered that they forgot to perform hand hygiene. So it seems that there's a lot of, of, of fear from doctors and nurses' perspective that teaching patients about the, the adequate indications for hand hygiene could backfire ultimately. And this is, this is a mentality that is pervasive in the in, 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 in healthcare system in that errors are shameful and errors have to be hidden. And you will lose your job if you perform an error. And what do very highly safe environments do? Well, they, do not, they welcome the detection and reporting of errors. It could be in nuclear uh, industry, it can be in, in, in the airline industry. Errors have to be reported because they need to be prevented. But we're not there yet. Well, you see it very well. We're not there yet. In, 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 in healthcare workers' minds, errors need to be hidden. Don't teach patients too much about hand hygiene. Don't ask them to ask about it. And I don't want to tell them because if they learn, they'll get angry at us. So many patients seem to be reluctant to ask about hand hygiene, and many healthcare workers have a negative perception of patient participation to improve hand hygiene. So is this the end of these programs? Should we just close the books and say, look, we've tried and it doesn't work? Well, personally, I don't think so. Because of this question, about 55% of, of healthcare workers said that such a program would likely improve their compliance. So it feels like actually the fear of the negative impact of having to acknowledge a mission will probably change their behavior so that they, they make sure that they perform in hygiene in front of the patient so that the patient doesn't have to ask about it. So what if patients do not ask? So I, I ask you the question, what is the proportion of patients that should actively remind healthcare workers for such a program to be considered effective? Would you be happy with 1%, 5%, 20%, 50%? What, do you, what does it take to, to be satisfied with such a program, to say this is a successful program? Well, maybe it doesn't give you a complete picture. The proportion of patients who ask does not give you the whole picture. Um, let's take two examples, two hypothetical examples. Two hospitals, patient, hospital A, hospital B. In Hospital A, 60% of patients ask about hand hygiene. Hospital B, only 2%. Which hospital is the safest? You think it's B, why? It's probably because they never have the opportunity to ask about hand hygiene. If you already have 80% compliance for hand hygiene, you can never ask. And the opposite is true. If you never do hand hygiene, there's a lot of opportunity to ask about it. So, I mean, people who say this doesn't work because anyways, patients never ask, they don't get the whole picture. The whole picture is what we want is not patients to ask. What we want is people to perform hand hygiene at the right moment. And this will only be, can only be assessed by measuring hand hygiene compliance as the ultimate goal. The proportion of patients who ask is just a surrogate marker. It doesn't give you the whole picture. Now, patient participation probably can improve hand hygiene compliance by, through different mechanisms. When you implement such a, such a program, you probably you, you raise awareness to healthcare workers. When healthcare workers see that now this is serious, hand hygiene is serious, you even patients are now getting involved into promoting hand hygiene. You just raise awareness, and only this is probably likely to act to improve your compliance. Now, there, then there's a normative pressure. If you know that patients are being told about the correct, moment, the correct indications to perform hand hygiene, you're probably more likely to do it adequately. And what is the best example for this? 
How do you behave when you treat another doctor who is, a, who is your patient? You are much more careful about everything you do with that patient. You will inform him better. You will probably do hand hygiene right before touching him. You are more careful because you know that he knows. So teaching patients is probably likely to improve your compliance with hand hygiene. He doesn't have to ask about it. And finally, there's a direct patient intervention. And the negative, the negative feelings associated with patients asking about hand hygiene is probably what is going to bring you to perform hand hygiene better, not the direct patient asking. The same way you respect the same limit to avoid unpleasant situations, you may be more likely to perform hand hygiene to avoid the unpleasant situation of having to acknowledge hand hygiene omission or having to perform hand hygiene in front of the patient. And the good thing is that we can change healthcare workers' vision, perception about patient involvement. And this is a study that was conducted more, almost 20 years ago where it has been shown that you can train healthcare workers to involve patients better about the decision-making process. So we can train healthcare workers, we just have to change the mentality. So it doesn't mean it's going to happen overnight, but there is room for improvement. So, uh, well, these are my conclusions, but if you listen to what I said, it's all there on the slide. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you have a question. <laughs> I think the lady was here first. So, uh, you know, go ahead, please. Yeah, please, Namida. Namida, go yeah. first. Okay. Fine. Uh, lovely presentations, both of you. I mean, I really enjoyed the presentations. I'm Namita Jaggi from Artemis Hospital, New Delhi, India. And I just wanted to share with you that uh, we've had a very similar experience with the patient participation. We made some patient uh, information leaflets about hand hygiene. And you very rightly said it's not really measurable as to how many patients asked or what was the impact. But the patients were very, very happy and it made them feel that this hospital is somewhat better because it's caring more for us. And uh, they, were, they had the more positive approach towards the healthcare workers, which eventually helped the healthcare workers also. So uh, maybe initially we had some resistance, minor resistance from healthcare workers, but when they saw the changed attitude of the patients, it helped them indirectly also. So it was a huge success. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yes, Andres? Eve, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. And, and number one, I want to comment on, uh, Obviously, we all know it was Hospital B because in epidemiology, it's always Hospital A that is guilty and Surgeon X. So we knew the answer ahead. But uh, with regard to the thing, I, I, what I, the point of George Anderson, in which I'm trying to do is that it doesn't take away any responsibilities. And I mean, you, you put it really nicely in your talk. You put both sides in there, all the two coins, or there are two sides to this coins, and you did that extremely well. Thank you so much for that. And you have me nearly convinced. But uh, <laughs> it, it, it really, we, we, should, we have to watch out that it doesn't take away any responsibility from our healthcare workers, and, and, and that's as little extra they do, but the patient does not stay responsible for its own health. Yeah, I agree with you completely. Yeah. Yes, please. Okay, thank you, uh, Eve. That was a good talk. My question is not for you, though. It's for the audience. Most of us here will be doctors and nurses. At some point, most of us will have been a patient can I just ask, how many people in the room have actually challenged a doctor or nurse looking after them, whether they've washed their hands? One or two, but not a huge member. Not a huge amount. Well, you're in very good company, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm just about to publish a couple of letters. Sorry, I'm the current editor of the Journal of Hospital Infection. And a one from a, a very experienced infection control nurse, and also from Stephanie Dancer who was my predecessor, and of those of you who know Stephanie, she's not exactly backward about coming forward. Um, but when she herself, unfortunately, was a patient earlier than this year, even she felt she was not able to do that. And in some cases, when she was worried about what was going on, it was the last thing on her mind. And both of these people have questioned whether it's actually fair to ask even educated people who are feeling scared and vulnerable um, and effectively put the responsibility on them. And I just want to leave you to think about that. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes, Hugo. Thanks, Eve, for uh, this excellent talk. Um, uh, two things. One is that um, when I was trained in, in, in uh, aviation in the, in the US FAA, they put in the before taxi checklist <clears throat> patient briefing. So you have to say patient briefing done. 
And the patient briefing on, um, uh, um, contains where the exits are, the fire extinguisher, and so. And one item is, uh, whenever you see something that is wrong, tell me. So this is the invitation, and it just hit me when I listened to you again, <clears throat> that the, the, this invitation um, is really also there in, in, in aviation. And I think that's a crucial point. I think uh, the crucial point is that we personally have to invite and establish a sort of a partnership with the patient on this issue. And it must be specific on this issue, and it must be explicit and personal. The only question now, as we are in a study uh, trying this uh, to implement this, is how do we convince healthcare workers to really take the time and do it, and take the courage and do it? What do you think? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think, personally, I think that the mentalities will change as if we keep on persisting with this fact that we presented, now it's a fact. Patients can ask about it. And at first, people, will, healthcare workers will be shocked probably about it, and afterwards, they'll just change their behavior. And uh, th there's one study I haven't presented here, but that ask, that ask healthcare workers, what was the impact of being asked at least once? So the five percent reporting being asked, what was their behavior? And they said that they were much more likely to to perform hand hygiene in the following days in front of a patient. So it takes only one. And it needs somebody who dares to voice his or her opinion to, to have an impact on the whole hand hygiene behavior of all the healthcare workers for a long time afterwards. It's not, it's not, it's not something that is only uh, punctual intervention. The punctual intervention has a, a long-lasting effect. And this is very well also shown that this is related to the patient personality. And uh, in, in, in our studies we've conducted here in Geneva, we also measured the healthcare worker, the, the patient's um, uh, um, character. And we have seen that the, the, the patients who are very likely to voice their opinion in many other aspects of their life are much more likely to ask about hand hygiene. And uh, probably if you're somebody who never voiced your opinion, you're probably, as a patient, probably will not ask about hand hygiene. But it only takes one patient to have a long-lasting effect. Okay, yes, please, sir. Thank you. I think that was a, a great talk, uh, as were all three. And I'd just like to go back to actually what uh, Hugo told us about uh, teamwork and, and the gorilla. And 40% of people here saw the gorilla. I got 13 passes, but I missed the gorilla. Everybody <laughs> in the team needs to be invited to participate. When we do the checklist in the OR, part of our explicit checklist is anybody who has any concern at any time during the operation must speak up. And this has to do with any aspect of patient safety, and, and the patient is part of the team, and they should be invited to speak up, but they shouldn't be fit. We shouldn't think they're responsible. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Completely agree with you. Yes. Yes. Sorry, I am not a scientist. I am not a physician. I am a journalist. Uh, it was not clear to me, browsing through the program, whether patient organizations are part of the organizing committee. I see that WHO is here, and WHO represents all uh, stakeholders, but I did not see clearly patient or, uh, organization. Second remark, uh, the general, uh, one of the reasons why the attitude uh, concerning hygiene has changed with health workers and patients is that the message that in, in the last generation has become very blurred. On one hand, we say hygiene is very important uh, and uh, hand washing saves life. This has been repeated from the 19th century, in the, the, the golden age of hygiene was the 19th century. Now we are all the time said that nature is good and nature knows what it does and too much hygiene and too much this and that is in fact uh, uh, creates adverse effects and see the nosocomial no, uh, uh, germ, etc. So in fact this slogan that uh, hygiene saves life loses its meaning because we can interpret it in twofold way. And my third remark is me as a patient, I will feel very reluctant to ask a nurse whether she has taken the proper measures because if I start doubting that, I will doubt any form of medical knowledge. So just one hour before going to the operation hall, I prefer to consider medical staff as angels and gods and not to have too much second thoughts. Yeah, before the last comment from our speaker, 
the chairman, can you comment about the patient participation? <laughs> we have the chairman here, you know, he runs the conference, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not patient participation? Thank you for you the question. Uh, in the professional committees, there are no patients, as you said, in the professional ones. But be assured, for in our surroundings and for the feedback, we had a lot of conflict even with patient organizations. So, yes, they are involved, even so they are not mentioned in writing among the professional committees. See? Uh, because we need something to improve for we need something to improve for 2013. They will be in there. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, the debate will occur later on, all right? The final comment, yes. Thank you. <laughs>